Still countdown. We're just days away from the first crewed mission for Boeing's Starliner spacecraft. We're sharing this with so many people, which means it is actually finally real. And I, I sort of have to pinch myself a little bit to understand where actually where we're going. The expectations heading into launch and what Boeing and NASA hope to accomplish. Artemis Insights, a new report from NASA's Office of Inspector General offers some updates on the progress towards the Artemis II mission, what's in the report, and what it could mean for the first crewed flight of the Orion spacecraft. And Dark Side of the Moon, China launches its sixth uncrewed mission to the moon with the goal of bringing back lunar samples. We'll talk about the long-term significance of exploring the dark side of the moon as both the United States and China are racing to send astronauts to the south pole of the moon before the end of the decade. Joining us for insight and analysis are Rachel Jewett, Senior Managing Editor of Via Satellite, and Joey Roulette, the U.S. Business of Space Correspondent for Reuters. From the Spaceflight Now News Bureau at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, this is news from the press site. And liftoff of Artemis 1. We rise together, back to the moon and beyond. Mission copies on board the International Space Station. Uh, go Falcon, go Dragon, go Crusader. This allows us to go faster and to have better technology. When we start putting humans on that vehicle, the excitement is even going to amp up even more. Thanks for taking the time to answer our questions. Hello there and welcome to another episode of News from the Press site. I'm Will Robinson-Smith, reporter for Space Light Now. So good of you to spend part of your day getting educated on the week that was in space flight. And what a week it has been, and what a week it's going to be, as Boeing is preparing to launch its first crewed mission using its Starliner spacecraft, launching atop an Atlas V rocket. And we've got lots more news to discuss and we've got a great panel with us to break it all down. Joining us first is Rachel Jewett. She's the Senior Managing Editor for Via Satellite. She joined the publication as an editor back in 2019, promoted in 2020. Before that, she was an editor for the Washington Post Express and worked as a copy editor for the New York Times. Rachel, welcome to the show. Hi, Will. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. I'm glad you were able to join us. And uh, rounding out our panel is Joey Roulette. He's on his second stint now with the Reuters Wire Service. He's also worked as a space reporter for the New York Times and The Verge. No stranger to Central Florida, Joey is also a University of Central Florida alumnus and spent a few years back working as a tech and politics reporter at Orlando Weekly. Joey, welcome to the show and soon welcome to the Sunshine State. Thanks so much. Absolutely. And so want to start where our cold open video began, which of course is the arrival of the CFT mission. We had the launch readiness review just a few hours ago as we were recording this on Friday, May 3rd. Also, uh, happy National Space Day, everyone. So appropriate time to be talking about crewed space flight. And Rachel, want to start with you. Um, you know, it's been years for Boeing to get to this point. Uh, lots of starts and setbacks. I wonder if you could just give us your thoughts to start off on Boeing finally reaching this moment, you know, going through the launch readiness review and now finally getting ready to lift off with Starliner and humans. Yeah, this is such a big milestone for Boeing and a long time coming. I remember the first test in 2019, I think it was like maybe my third week at VIA Satellite. It was very early into me covering the space industry. Um, and, you know, that one, it didn't work. And it's been years. They had to run the second test that Boeing had to pay for. Uh, so it seems like everyone's really confident now that they've resolved everything. And it's just a, it, it will be a big deal for Boeing to be successful at this test. And Joey, you're going to be traveling down to Florida, obviously, to cover the launch here in person. Um, 
from the LRR press conference that happened just, again, a few hours ago as we're recording this, what was your big takeaway from what we heard from folks like Mark Nappi, uh, Gary Wentz with ULA, and some of the others on the panel? Yeah. Um, echoing what Rachel said, you know, it has been a long time to get to this point, and I feel like I've said so many times that exact same thing, that this is a big moment for Boeing. We got to see if they're going to be able to do it, and it's, it's a crucial moment for the business. Um, and they kind of seem to reiterate that on the call that happened just a few hours ago and, and kind of affirm their confidence in this mission. Um, you know, they, I keep hearing over and over again that NASA wouldn't allow this to happen if they weren't fully confident that this would uh, be safe for the astronauts. But they're also, you know, hedging a little bit. They're acknowledging that this is a test um, like the other missions. This is the biggest, most climactic test in Boeing's Starliner program. Um, so yeah, I think one of the most, you know, memorable things from the, from the, uh, you know, press conference was the, that weather looks good. And that's at this point kind of what I'm looking out for too, just for my own time too, but, but that's good to hear. So I, I think, you know, pending good weather, pending the resolution of the remaining issues, we're, we're looking forward to a, a good launch on Monday night. Yeah. I was actually talking with one of the, uh, parachute techs earlier today and, mentioned that they've, you know, thoroughly gone through it. They'll obviously review the data coming out of CFT. Uh, Rachel, for you, you know, we saw the halting of the mission with OFT. We saw it dock with station back with OFT2 and have a successful landing. In the CFT mission profile, what do you mostly have your eye on? What are you going to be watching to see, you know, how it works and how well it works? Yeah. You know, to be honest, at via satellite, the you know, while this is a huge thing for the space industry, it's a little tangential for our area of coverage. So, you know, I don't watch all of the specifics as closely. Um, but one thing I will say is, it, you know, it's very important for Boeing Defense in Space because that segment has really struggled. It's important that they get this right and that they don't have to do a repeat test. Obviously, there's there's crew on board, so just having the safety of the crew is the most critical thing. Um, but you know, Boeing Defense has had a lot of financial issues. They're overrun on a number of programs. So it's really important that this is successful. Yeah, and we'll be talking a little bit more about a uh, national defense story a little bit later in our conversation. Uh, but Joey, to that point, um, you know, during the press conference, the question was asked about, you know, the airline side versus the defense and space side. You know, we've all reported the you know financial hit that Boeing's taken from you know all the setbacks and delays. How just crucial is it that everything goes as perfectly as possible once this thing leaves the ground? It's incredibly crucial. Um, I mean, think back to 2019 when at that time Boeing really needed a win um, for its entire business. That was you know shortly after the. 737 MAX crises where, you know, two planes had crashed. Um, and, you know, Boeing was really stressing the importance of a successful mission. Of course, that mission didn't go as planned at all. And Boeing has had several issues and challenges since then. Um, so, you know, here we are again. It's even more important for the company to succeed. Um, I think what's on the top of the minds of, you know, the general audience who are looking out, you know, from on the outside looking in into this, who don't really follow the program very closely. I mean, they see Boeing in the headlines so often these days um, with problems. You know, I mean, the most recent problem in the aviation business was the blowout on the Alaskan Airlines flight. Um, and so now the, the latest headline they're going to be seeing is Boeing is launching humans to space at a time when they're suffering um, on their most experienced, you know, side of the business with, with airplanes uh, that don't go into space. Um, and so I, you know, if Boeing succeeds, that'll be a great refreshing moment for the company. Um, this is a test. And so, you know, especially with Boeing, it's important to test things. Um, and given the history that we've seen on the other side of the business and the company culture on, you know, the FAA oversight and how it kind of interacts with the government, um, there's been investigation after investigation into the aviation side of things. And um, they still experience problems. And that kind of has happened on the space unit side as well. Um, so, you know, it'll be great if this is a successful mission. But, um, you know, NASA still needs to have oversight over the company and make sure that, you know, they continue that streak of success. Well, 
speaking of uh, oversight and uh, thorough investigations, that is a good segue to our next story topic, talking about the OIG, the Office of Inspector General report that came out looking at the Artemis II mission and some of the really key items that are standing between where we are now and that mission launching in September of 2025. Starting with uh, you, Joey, on this one, and we'll go back around the horn the other way. You know, this report, uh, you know, lifted up some things that were concerning to a lot of folks, especially, you know, seeing some of the pictures of the heat shield, which is something that they're still doing analysis on, was seeing those descriptions and those images uh, surprising to you, or did it sort of seem in line with what we'd been hearing before the report came out? It was in line with what we had been hearing, but it was, there were a lot of new details, and I think the extent of the problems were, um, you know, broadened, you know, we, we, it was a, it was a view into those issues that we hadn't had before from NASA directly. And we always, you know, appreciate the transparency that NASA provides, but even more so that the OIG provides in these reports that usually say things that the agency isn't willing to say. Um, admittedly, I didn't read the report in detail. There's a lot going on in space these days. Um, but I think that is a really crucial issue for NASA that they're going to have to overcome before this next mission. I mean, there's a lot of talk about whether, the agency should defer the moon landing to Artemis 4 and you know have Artemis 3 be another kind of repeat uncrewed or some other kind of demo that doesn't inc include the moon landing given the challenges technically on not just Orion but Starship and all the other elements um and so to see this come out the you know the deep, the problems and the challenges that the Orion program is facing in more detail um just kind of adds to the pressure for NASA to maybe extend its testing campaign a little bit more and change things up, um, which inherently is is difficult for the agency to do if it cares about this race with China to the moon, um, as Bill Nelson, you know, reminds us often. Yeah, and Rachel, the last time the Artemis II astronauts were down here at Kennedy uh, checking out their Orion spacecraft, uh, one of the things that Reed Weissman mentioned during the post-conference after that was, you know, really wanting to get more details and a lot of data about the heat shield. Um, you know, obviously, like Joey said, there's been a lot happening in space news, so I don't know if you've had a, a chance to really thoroughly dig through all the details of the report. Uh, but what jumped out at you um, if you had a chance to really, you know, sink your teeth into it? Yeah, so it, there was, you know, one phrase that, you know, they said that these issues with the heat shield, the separation bolts, and the power distribution pose significant risks to the safety of the crew. So I think that is a, it's a very firm statement. Um, it's kind of alarming to see that in such stark terms. Uh, it seemed like NASA's response in the report, and Eric Berger highlighted this in an article this week, that NASA's response was kind of like, you know, we are already working on these issues. We know what the issues are. But like Joey said, to see it all laid out in such detail was, um, a, you know, a little bit scary. And I guess just, you know, lastly, before we wrap this part of the conversation, you know, we've seen, obviously, delays to the Artemis program, you know, over the years. Do you think, based off of what we're seeing in the report, that this is just an indication that we may see that September 25 become a little more squishy and possibly a, a 2026 time frame is a little more realistic. Uh, Joey, I'll throw that to you and to Rachel if you want to chime in as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's an understatement to say 2026 is a little more realistic. I mean, um, that might not even be realistic. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but yeah, NASA with this program across the other administration has been known to make these ambitious timelines. And I think this is just one of the many things that's going to push it back a little bit more. And Rachel, what do you think? Yeah, is I would 25? disagree with that. Yeah. I don't think anyone would be surprised if it slips to 26 or even later. Well, we will certainly be keeping our eyes and ears open for any additional adjustments. Uh, but speaking of the moon, it was actually a pretty active day for lunar exploration as China launched the Chang'e 6 mission heading to the far side of the moon. Uh, we talked a little bit about the race to the South Pole, uh, but Rachel, starting with you, I know, you know it's not so much on the, the satellite side of the, the work you normally cover, but you know, I, I guess what's your thoughts on this latest uh, proverbial flag being planted 
by China exploring a part of the moon that you know we haven't and hoping to bring samples back from it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that will be a, a setback for the US if China is able to, to get to the side of the moon before we are. Um, I also noticed that other countries, you know, Europe has payloads on the mission. So there's more collaboration with China there where the US was not collaborating with China on this mission. Um, and, you know, understandably, but it just shows how in it shows how intense the the space race is between the U.S. and China. And to that point of collaboration and cooperation, Joey, I mean, we've seen, I think we're up to 30 or around there signatories to the Artemis Accords. Um, do you think at some point down the road there be can, some level of uh, cooperation or, or communication on the moon between the U.S.? In China, mm -hmm. or this, or do you think this will just be a, a persistent space race, you know, with with some level of animosity between the two countries? Yeah, um, I, I'd agree with Rachel. You know, the this upcoming landing, if they are successful and if they can bring samples back, that'll really, you know, keep everyone in America on their on the edge of their seats, and it'll ramp up the competitive spirit that we've been talking about for years. But um, you know, there's. There's coordination and then there's collaboration, right? I think coordination between, I think all parties realize that coordination is is going to be super important on the moon simply to just deconflict activities to prevent some kind of miscalculation, um, to prevent a rover driving over some significant Chinese landmark or vice versa. Um, nobody wants that to happen. So I think coordination and encoding that into some clear international legal regime, regime is something that NASA realizes is important. Um, and then there's collaboration, which is more of a strategic, broader, abstract question that I think, you know, U.S. officials are starting to kind of contend with in an interesting way. There was an event earlier this week um, where Pam Melroy, deputy administrator at NASA, was asked um, that question whether, you know, we think uh, that NASA should collaborate more with China, assuming the Wolf Amendment, which bars that from happening, didn't exist. Um, and she kind of gave this, you know, complex kind of cagey answer saying that we would collaborate and welcome collaboration with any country. Um, and, and I think as with what other NASA officials focus on is the element of transparency and scientific transparency. So as long as China can agree to be transparent with, the, with its activities and its scientific products on the moon, then that is something where the U.S. would welcome them to um, cooperate. But you know, I, before, I just want to also say before, um, you know, Pam Melroy took office as deputy administrator, she was supportive of collaborating with China, and she um, was kind of vocal about that. Now, of course, as a government official, she has to walk a different line and take a different tone on it. But despite the competition and the rhetoric we hear about how China is this adversary, I'm getting the sense that people at both NASA, state, and the Department of Defense are a little bit more you know, open to entertaining the idea of some time down the road, cooperating with China from a strategic perspective, um, especially given that they're t turning out to be such a formidable uh, rival in space. Yeah, and Rachel, to the point that Joey just made, um, based on the reporting you and your colleagues at VIA Satellite have done, do you think that having Pam Melroy's voice in the room, you know, alongside Nelson can create some of more level of transparency, especially when it comes to, you know, putting boots on the South Pole of the moon, um, that maybe it won't be quite as potentially uh, headbutting as uh, Bill Nelson has suggested it could be where China lands and says, this is our zone, you got to keep out, that maybe it won't necessarily come to that. Oh, I don't know. I, I could hope that it would be more uh, coordinated, like Joey said, but I really, I couldn't say. Fair enough. I suppose none of us have a crystal ball, so we'll just have to kind of wait to see <laughs> well, where well, the cards fall. One thing, one thing I just want to say on that, I mean, yeah. look at the Apollo Soyuz project decades ago. Um, the USSR was an adversary at the time. Um, this was, you know, around the Cold War. Um, but the U.S. found ways to come together with the Russians and that, you know, produced the International Space Station, which still continues to this day. Um, and so that kind of kept Russia's, Russia occupied from the U.S. perspective um, to do good in space, in the civil space program. Um, and if we want to build some kind of diplomatic bridge with China, um, I think people are starting to see that maybe something similar like that 
would be the move later on down the road as we're both trying to go to the same place in space. Maybe an Apollo Soyuz style uh, handshake on the moon is in order then that, that could maybe solve some things. One other thing I would just say on that is look at the news this week of TikTok of Congress, you know, wanting to force the sale of TikTok from a Chinese company. So I don't think that that bodes well to collaboration with China <laughs> overall. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good point. Yeah, plus it's an election year. So, you know, yeah. lots of posturing is going around, I think maybe yeah. until 2025, when some of that political dust settles, maybe we can start to have some of these conversations, but, you know, maybe not right before votes are cast. Uh, moving along, you know, it has certainly been a busy week on the launch front. We're going to come back to our panel conversation, but just want to give folks a quick recap of the missions that lifted off from Florida and around the world. Starting first with a Falcon 9 flight lifting off from here at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. We had that rocket lift off back on uh, April 28th, uh, just after midnight UTC, sending up uh, the Galileo uh, satellites heading up to space on behalf of the European Commission, although they were quick to just refer to it as the launcher and really not give SpaceX any credit for this mission. Moving along, we had Another SpaceX flight, the Starlink 6-54 mission, sending up 23 V2 mini satellites up to low Earth orbit later in the day on the 28th. Next, another Falcon flight, this time from over in California. The first pair of Worldview Legion 1 and 2 satellites on behalf of Maxar that are currently on orbit. Their solar panels have unfurled and they're starting their operations and checkouts. And then of course, lastly, we had the launch that we've, or ex excuse me, there's one more that I'm forgetting about. It was a, a busy night in launches. There was the Starlink 6-55 mission back here in Florida lifting off from Pad 40. And then finally, I believe is our last one. Yes, from China, the launch of the Long March 5 rocket with the Chang'e 6 and the lunar probe heading to the moon's uh, dark side heading to bring some samples back. So speaking of bringing back, bring our panelists back in here. Uh, Rachel, starting with you on this one, were there any launches in particular that besides the uh, Chang'e 6 mission that happened to jump out at you? Yeah, the Maxar launch is a huge milestone. So that program has been super delayed. I think those satellites were originally, they could have launched as early as I think mid 2021. Um, and there were work delays, hardware delays. Maxar really struggled during the pandemic with getting those satellites together. Um, since then, the company was taken private. It was acquired by a private equity firm. Uh, so they kind of stopped providing updates after that. Um, and then it was, it was during satellite this year in March when they finally got an email and they announced they were like, okay, we're, we're shipping them to the launch site. So um, this is a, a really a milestone launch for Maxar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it was great to see those two satellites finally heading up. Um, Joey, anything from you jumping out this week? I mean, certainly one thing of note was we've gotten to a point of uh, now the third 20th Falcon first stage booster to launch for SpaceX. Also 200 successful payload deployments. So a couple of notable milestones for the company this week. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's, there's always, it's like every week there's a milestone for SpaceX and it's hard to track them all. Um, and there's so many launches all the time too. So I actually can't really answer your question on which one stood out to me. The I mean, I think, you know, China's launch of, um, you know, their lunar spacecraft is pretty cool. And I think that's a huge deal for their um, space prowess and the international space competition. So that's kind of the one that I would highlight. Um, but, you know, especially with SpaceX, it's hard to pick one. <laughs> yeah, on that point, Joey, I would say with uh, the European Commission launching with SpaceX, it's not, it's not significant for SpaceX, but that Europe doesn't have any launch options right now. You know, we're still waiting on Ariane 6, so they had to cut a deal with SpaceX, which I'm sure that wasn't their first choice. You know, they want to use European launch capability, uh, but that just shows how dominant SpaceX is and yeah. how the European launch is, is really struggling right now. Absolutely, yeah. Well, and the fact that basically in all their social media posts, they either referred it to the launcher 
you know, never said that it launched from Florida. Um, so I think probably some elements of national pride came in. And, and to your point, Rachel, you know, not having Ariane 6 as they were hoping to, not having Vegas C, you know, not having the Soyuz down in French Guiana. You know, it's all been, you know, a lot of setbacks for them. Um, you know, from the, the satellite world, uh, you know, how big of a deal is it that, you know, Europe really hasn't had its own medium or heavy lift launchers for as long as they've had? Yeah, I mean, all of these satellites are still getting launched, but they're being launched by SpaceX. So I don't think that anything is on the ground and not going up. But I do think that more from a geopolitical national security stance from Europe, uh, I think it means more to Europe that they have to go with SpaceX for these launches. Um, but we're, I mean, the actual missions themselves are, are still going up. Yeah, I think certainly the, the customers would be glad that that's still happening. Well, speaking of customers, want to talk about uh, some reporting that you both have done. Joey, starting with the story yours from recently, uh, exclusive you had for Reuters that Northrop Grumman is partnering with SpaceX on its Starshield program. Uh, this is something that obviously SpaceX has not talked about a lot uh, in your story. I think uh, Northrop Grumman also declined to comment. But if you could just give a little background on the reporting and what it's telling you about, you know, the the Starshield program and, and what we're learning about it at this point. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and you're right. Uh, SpaceX and Northrop haven't talked about this um, because it's a classified program, but it's a very, very significant capability that they are building for the U.S. government. And I think it is very significant that SpaceX was picked to have a lead role on this program. Um, for years, a lot of the remote sensing company, and Rachel, you probably know more about this than I do, but the remote sensing companies have kind of been afraid that of the prospect of SpaceX getting into the remote sensing business um, or doing anything like this, providing its expertise and its you know might on developing Starlink and applying that into the remote sensing field. That's something that you know people didn't really want to see because SpaceX had such a disruptive potential there. And here we are um, in the classified world. SpaceX has been on contract for some for just that since 2021. Um, and, you know, I think Northrop's involvement in it shows how important the U.S. government sees, um, you know, diversification for such an important and sensitive military intelligence system. Um, and SpaceX had, you know, has this culture of wanting to do things itself and do things its own way because it's faster than the traditional methods of deploying systems into space. Um, but, you know, the U.S. government wanted Northrop involved. Um, and so that's what happened. Um, and I think we're going to see the first batch of operational satellites launch pretty soon. Oh. Sorry, Rachel, did you want to jump in there? Oh, I was just because I mean, no, it was great reporting from Joey. Uh, really good scoop. Uh, I was, I guess I was surprised, you know, I did because it's classified, we don't know a lot about it. Um, but yeah, to see that SpaceX is being involved on Earth observation, uh, just like you said. I actually asked about your reporting uh, at Space Symposium. I did a uh, Earth observation panel on the Nova space track, and I had Umbra, Maxar, Black Sky, a lot of the EO providers. And, you know, they, they were all like, there's enough government business to go around. They said they don't lose sleep over SpaceX taking their market share, um, but... It, SpaceX has really disrupted the SATCOM market, so maybe they should be a little more concerned. Yeah, the, the interesting thing about Symposium is that um, during the panels, they they there's one narrative, and then when you're off of the panel, you know, off the panels, yeah. everyone seems to be like, no, actually, this is a very threatening thing. Yeah. Um, but 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 it's interesting to hear that's kind of the face that they're putting on is that no, this isn't we're not lose, losing sleep over this, and maybe some of them are right. Um, but I think the concept of Starlink, the proliferated LEO concept, is very threatening to the old way of doing remote sensing. Um, and unless a company is able to step up and provide that many satellites or that kind of architecture or collaborate in some way with it, um, they, I think they might see some problems in the future. Yeah, how could it not be? How could it not be concerning? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, I think they've launched, what, 6,200 Starlink so far, and they've currently got somewhere in the neighborhood of 58 currently still on orbit. So, you know, 
they very much have a presence. Um, Joey, did it seem like uh, in this latest round of your reporting that in addition to Northrop Grumman, there may be another yet-to-be-named player that's also part of this constellation, if you'll pardon the pun? Or does it seem like SpaceX and Northrop are kind of like the two main or the two primes, if you will? I don't know. I mean, I, I will say that they're the two main players in this constellation. Um, and I think, you know, the, the potential opportunities for those two main players, not just in the present moment with the present contracts they have, but in the long term is also significant as well. Because when you look at Star Starlink is, you know, the, the biggest Leo constellation right now. So I think the world is kind of just new to that and how that is maintained over time. Um, and what this is, what this classified star shield system is, is a government owned Starlink, basically, with you know more robust capabilities, of course. Um, so how that is managed, I think, from a government perspective, is very interesting. And what I mean by down the road and why that's interesting is, you know, these LEO satellites are going to be designed to deorbit over a certain schedule. So what kind of mechanism is in place for replenishing those satellites if this is a government owned system? Will other companies be able to pick up the tab and, and replenish those satellites themselves? Or do they have to be SpaceX satellites? It raises a lot of questions. And unfortunately, it's all classified. So it's really hard to answer those questions. Um, but I would imagine such a significant capability would be declassified at some point, And you would think SpaceX would want to flex these remote sensing capabilities. So it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. <clears throat> Yeah, very curious to see if this comes out of stealth at some point and if we can all learn a little more transparently about exactly what's going on with the system. Well, it, going to our last story and some of your reporting, Rachel, and uh, you and your colleagues have done some great stories on this. Um, SES agreement to acquire Intelsat, obviously a big move in the satellite world. If you can set our viewers and listeners up for sort of how we got to this point. I mean, it seems like it was expected probably for some time, but just how big of a shift in the market is that we finally got in this concrete step? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this has been rumored in conversations in the works for years. Um, SES and Intelsat are two of the biggest satellite operators. Uh, I don't want to say the biggest because I'm not sure between SES, Intelsat, and Utelsat, which are, but it, two of the three largest satellite operators in terms of uh, geo fleets. So it's it. Last summer they they confirmed that they were in talks, and then they pulled back and said we're not going to merge. And right around that same time, the longtime CEO of SES stepped down, and they said that those things were not related. Um, but now here we are. We're like two months into SES having a new CEO, and the deal the deal does happen. Um, Previously, they were looking at a merger, and in this situation, SES is acquiring Intelsat. Um, so I think that changed the conversation a little bit. Um, they, between the two of them, they have around a hundred geo satellites. They have a, a pretty substantial chunk of geo capacity on orbit. I think it's around thirty percent. Um, so it, this is driven by the competition from Starlink. That's what we're seeing across the satellite industry. Um, Last year, Viasat bought Inmarsat, uh, Utelsat bought the Leo, the only non-Starlink Leo constellation that's in orbit right now, OneWeb. So among like the biggest satellite players in the past, I guess, like two years, uh, there's been a ton of shifts. So um, it, it will be interesting. They both, SES and Intelsat, uh, supply a lot of capacity to the U.S. government. Um, so... I, you know, I don't know if that means more business to the U.S. government or if they'll just be able to charge more. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very substantial merger in the satellite sector. Well, and given its size and some of the other points of consolidation that you mentioned we've seen over the last couple of years, do you foresee any regulatory hurdles to this going through? Or based on your reporting, does it seem like a fairly uh, solid footing thing and a kind of a done deal at this point? Yeah, no, I don't think it's a done deal. Um, SES's CEO addressed that this week and he said there are going, you know, he's like, it's, there's, he was like, we don't take it lightly. We don't consider it a done deal. We are going to face regulatory hurdles. Um, I, some analysts said that this, that it could be a bigger challenge than they think. Um, I, and we'll just have to see how it plays out with 
Viasat and Inmarsat, I think there was more uh, more roadblocks from the UK. Um, the UK is not, not a player in this deal. Um, so we'll see. But yeah, I, I think there could be some regulatory concerns. And Joey, not to loop you out of this part of the conversation, uh, you know, were you surprised to, to hear this news or, or were you also hearing some of the same rumblings that Rachel was talking about, that it was sort of in the winds for a while and seemed to just coalesce now and that was sort of expected? Yeah, no, no worries. I mean, Rachel, I, I agree with everything um, you were saying. Like, I think this was expected at some point a, a few years ago. Um, I haven't been tracking it as closely and as, as well as Rachel has been. Um, but, you know, I, I, from my perspective, I think this is just the latest example of a reaction to the rise of Starlink. I'm sure there's other nuance to it. There might be other parts of the deal that are less related to Starlink as competition, but um, you know, they, these are two giants merging together. So it'll be interesting to see how that um, takes shape from a regulatory perspective um, and from a geopolitical perspective as well. Absolutely. Definitely looking forward to uh, seeing how this all shakes out and seeing how you all report about it. And unfortunately, we've somehow at the end of our hours. So we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. But before we do, of course, want to ask you both. Uh, Rachel, we'll start with you and then Joey to you. Uh, where can folks follow your work and what do you have your eye on next week? Although I think probably Starliner is kind of the answer for most of us. Yes, uh, you can uh, via satellite.com. Uh, I My handle on Twitter is rmpodner, but I'm not super active on Twitter. Um, yes, so via satellite's website is the best place to find me and and uh, email me news tips also. Yeah, so definitely the Starliner test this coming week. Um, yeah, I would I would say that's that's the main thing for next week. I agree. Yeah, Starliner is the the big headline next week. Um, there's a lot a lot going on. It's hard to pick which one um, to look at. Uh, there's a lot of threats in the world and in in space as well. Um, so I think that's something to kind of keep an eye on. Um, to follow my work, uh, you can go to Reuters.com um, or my Twitter, which is J O Roulette. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Well, I'm excited to keep you know reporting out the constant stream of space news um it's extremely exhausting rachel as i know i'm sure you know too but yeah thanks thank you will for for doing this this was a really good conversation yeah appreciate the both of you and your time rachel joey thanks for joining us yeah so thank much. you and that will do it for this week's episode of news from the press site want to thank all of you at home for taking some time to get a little bit smarter about the week that was in space news as they both mentioned, of course, the crew flight of Starliner set to launch no earlier than May 6th is kind of what we've got our eyes closely on. But there are a pair of Starlink satellite missions that are going to be launching. One on Monday from Pad 39A. I believe we have a live view of that as we're recording this. You can see the, the pad getting ready. And then, of course, over on Pad 40 over at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, on the other side of the Starliner launch, have another... Uh, batch of Starlink satellites going up as well. So space never sleeps. Always busy, as Joey said. So for the guys behind the camera, for Adam Bernstein and Stephen Young, I'm Will Robinson-Smith. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Be good to yourselves, be good to others, and we will see you next time at Astra. <laughs>